Fritz Asher was born in Berlin in 1893. Berlin was a city at that point coming into its own as a modern center of culture, like Paris and Vienna, and commerce. It was third largest after London and Paris at that point, and its growth in part was due to industry that had been accumulating over the previous century, and that brought in a lot of people from elsewhere settling to work in the factories and across the city. Fritz's father, Hugo Asher, had in fact come from elsewhere, and he met Hugo's mother, Mina, who came from a rather prominent Jewish banking family. And Fritz was born as the only son. After him, his sister, his sister Charlotte was born the following year in 1894, and a second sister, Margareta, in 1897. And it would seem that later on with Charlotte, he had a good relationship, although there's some evidence that eventually he had no relationship with the remaining members of his family at all. Among the things that's interesting for his story is this. In 1901, so Fritz would have been eight years old, his father decided to be baptized and to have the children baptized. Now, this was not altogether unusual, particularly in Germany and the German states and Prussia in that era and in the previous 40, 50, 60 years. Jews had found themselves, for a variety of reasons, on the receiving end of an emancipation process that began with Joseph II, the Habsburg Emperor, in 1782, and continued on and off in various Western and Central European countries until England at the end of the 1850s. The German-speaking countries, Prussia and its satellites, were noteworthy for the following. Emancipation rights would be given to the Jews. A little bit later on, someone else would take them away. They'd be returned, they'd be taken away, so that between about 18 18 and the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, those rights had come and gone and come and gone. So one of the consequences of this is that Jews who in any case had been encouraged both from themselves and from the outside Christian world to, to assimilate into that larger world that saw itself in theory as less and less Christian, more and more post-Christian or secular, Jews who had been encouraged to do that found themselves more often than not, well, not quite getting the rights they thought they would get, or they'd get them and they'd be gone again. So it became increasingly not uncommon for Jews to convert, to be baptized, with the idea that, accordingly, they could fit into the mainstream more fully and more comfortably. Of course, that too would end up not a simple matter, since by 1878, a very important German pamphleteer and political philosopher by the name of Wilhelm Marr, in writing about Jews and writing about race, this new idea that in the academia of anthropology and the anthropological world of academia had become very popular, that Jews were a race apart. They can never be German. They can never be European. They're not just a separate religion. They're a separate race. And he took out of linguistics the term Semite, and he began to apply it as a racial term to Jews. The consequence of which would be, of course, that you could convert from Judaism, but you couldn't necessarily cease to be or cease to be regarded as a Jew because of your race. Nationalism was a rampant idea that would affect everybody as well. So the position of Hugo Asher, a successful doctor of dentistry who'd made a fortune because he had co-created a kind of of material that you could coat on the teeth. The situation for him would seem to be, as for many others, if I want my children to have all the advantages of being part of the mainstream, they need to be part of the mainstream, at least by religion. And so the kids are converted, or at least they are baptized in 1901. There's no proof or no evidence that they became active in the Protestant church, but they ceased to be active anyway, in any case, in the Jewish community. As an aspiring and apparently very talented young artist, Fritz Asher, at the age of 16 in 1909, met the preeminent painter of that era in Germany, and that was Max Lieberman, who happened, by the way, to be Jewish, very secular, but a Jew, and was head of the Academy in Dusseldorf, 
He had been the head of the German Secession earlier. He was really a figure among figures within the art scene. And apparently Fritz did some drawing or painting or sketch of Lieberman. Lieberman said, this is a talented kid. So he saw to it that Fritz Ascher won a prize which carried a scholarship for him to study in Königsberg at the academy there. And he made a good number of friends, among other things, and developed his talent. By 1913, he was back in Berlin. And over the next year or so, another array of friends. He spent some time in Munich, where he became intimate with members of the group known as Die Brücke. He became intimate with those involved in producing a cultural magazine called Simplicissimus. He met people like Kate Kölwitz. He met people like Gustav Meyrink, who in the following year would pen the most recent of a series of versions of the story known as the Golem. World War I broke out in 1914. There were many artists who volunteered for service. Fritz Ascher was not amongst them. He was opposed to the idea of war. And perhaps not by coincidence, that year one of his more important, strong early paintings is produced called Der Vereinsamte, The Lonely One. In German, Ein means one, and F, uh, V E R, Fer, is an intensifier. So Vereinsamte is someone who is in, in an intense manner one on his own. And we see this very muscular figure whose head is tilted slightly to his right, the viewer's left with strong and stormy skies behind him, but he has, he offers, he gives the sense of having the strength to withstand the storms of the world around him. And it seems to me that we might look at this as a kind of conceptual self-portrait of the artist, who at that time cuts against the mainstream by deciding not to be part of the war effort, to stay behind in Berlin and work on his art, the following year, 1915, is the year when another of his important paintings is offered to the world. It's a painting of Golgotha. It's a painting that shows what in effect is another Vereinsamte, Christ, on the cross. Oddly placed, barely can we see him at the very top of the image with the two thieves to either side of him. And yet there is a kind of sunburst that comes from them pouring down on what the main subject seems to be visually in the foreground. This figure just off to the lower right, clearly a Roman soldier, clearly angry and strong on his horse with weapons, driving away the foreground figures who are all coming out toward the viewer all of them wearing very colorful garments that suggest in a kind of romanticized, stereotypical manner, the kind of clothes that certainly at that time and in many times, later day people have assumed that biblical characters wore. In any case, they very prominently display what would have been stereotypical Jewish features, their eyes, their noses, their lips, the very features that were looked at as stereotypically Jewish occupy the faces of these foreground figures being driven away from Golgotha by this soldier who perhaps is intended to be Longinus, the Roman soldier credited with stabbing Christ in the side with his spear, but then later on realizing, oh my God, this was a mistake. This is truly the man, the son of God, Ecce Homo, and is regarded as the first pagan Roman to become, as it were, a proto-Christian. The following year, 1916, so in three successive years, we have three successive very important paintings that suggest isolated, individualized loneliness, the lonely one in the first place, Christ as a Vereinsamte in the second place, sui generis, standing apart from others, and in 1916 now, the Golem, that story that speaks of a creature created back in late 16th or very early 17th century Prague by the Kabbalist Judah Lowe, who with the assistance of two other individuals, perhaps the sexton, perhaps his son-in-law, created by using very esoteric Kabbalistic formulae, this creature made of mud, going out of Prague at night at midnight, of course, and by the river that flows by Prague 
creating the shape of a creature of Earth, and each of the three others were understood to control, as it were, the three other elements, one representing water, one representing air, one representing fire. Rabbi Lowe stood at the head of this creature. His two assistants stood at the two hands of this creature. And after the appropriate recitations, and after circling and counter-circling this creature seven times, it rose. It became animated in the sense of active and alive. Not animated, however, in the sense of having an anima, which is the Latin word for soul, in the sense of having a soul. If God created the first man, Adam, from Adama, which is a Hebrew word for earth, which is red, Adom, Judalo emulates that, but he can't be sold a creature. And yet, traditions grew in the late 19th and early 20th century, not in the intervening centuries, about the golem, that it could read, that it could write. He couldn't speak, because speaking would apparently represent its condition of souledness, of be souledness that it didn't have. It's a creature that was designed to help the Jewish community survive difficult conditions, to protect it from Christian neighbors. It also performed menial tasks, apparently, for Rabbi Lowe, bringing water from the river, let's say, or gathering wood for fire from the forests nearby, let's say. So it did both more exalted and more, more banal kinds of work. But the story would have it that one day when Judah Lowe was out of town, the creature ran amok and only Judah Lowe knew how to control it. So in the end, he had to put it out of commission. The final touch in his animating it was, according to four different variants on the story, that he wrote the name of God across its forehead, that he wrote the name of God, the ineffable name of God, on a piece of paper and stuck it in his mouth, or that he wrote the words truth that in Hebrew consists of the first, last, and middle letters of the Hebrew alphabet on a piece of paper put it in his mouth or across his forehead. To decommission the creature then, he either erased what was on the forehead, if it were truth, and you erased the first letter, what you'd be left with is the word in Hebrew for death. Or he took it on the piece of paper out of the creature's mouth and then stored it till whenever the future might require it in the attic of the old synagogue in Prague. As I said, the interest in the golem did not last for the most part after a generation or two beyond the time of Judah Lowe, but reemerged in the late 19th century. And a fellow by the name of Judah Rosenberg wrote an account of it in Yiddish, which he claimed to be something which he simply copied from the memoirs, as it were, of the rabbi Judah Lowe. In any case, it became novelized a number of times. A fellow by the name of Chaim Bloch, and for our purposes, and the purposes of understanding Fritz Asher by Gustav Meyerink, it was become a story that was being read all over Europe. That's the figure whom, whom Fritz Asher portrays in his painting of 1916. The painting comprises four figures. We have the image of the golem towering in the background over the other three and looking straight out at the viewer. And as for those three figures, apparently, the rabbi himself with a long flowing white beard and his two assistants, all three of them are marked in particular by the fact that they don't look out at us. They look down to the right as if they're seeing something and their eyes are wide with what appears to be fright. They have extremely large hands they're not very complementary images. And one of the questions one might ask about the vision of the golem that is presented by Judah Lowe, is this a vision that reflects his Jewish background, his Christian background, or a combination of both? Certainly the golem has been treated in a sympathetic manner, but then Judah Lowe, the great, great rabbi, doesn't appear to be treated in a sympathetic manner. Is this is this recalling the danger that the story of the golem reminded Jews that they faced if they turned to physicality 
as a means of protecting themselves. Traditionally, it hadn't been the physical, it had been the intellectual that would protect the Jews because as a scattered minority in vast Christian and elsewhere Muslim and Hindu seas, physicality was not likely to be the weapon that would be most useful to them. And the fact that the golem runs amok and becomes a disaster tale at the end would suggest that as a cautionary tale, its story was one about this is not the direction we should go. Or is it a perspective that is Christian that sees this character and as, as okay, but then sees the rabbi who created the character as not okay, as the kind of Jew par excellence? One might also think of the golem as another Vereinsamte, of course. He's a lonely one. He is sui generis. He is, in that sense, like that first image, which I've suggested is a kind of conceptual self-portrait, the lonely one, the Vereinsamte that, that was painted by Asher in 1914. And then the image of Golgotha, which gives us a Christ who is, by definition, a Vereinsamte. And now the golem, too, a kind of Vereinsamte, and like Christ, well, not like other humans. In fact, the golem is humanized, but not human. Christ is human, but also divine. Is this part of a pattern of creating images that focus on isolated, lonely individuals, of which Fritz Asher himself, who before the war had been notably very social and sociable, a lot, wide circle of friends, a lot of hanging out with others, in the course of World War I and in the decades to follow, would become less and less social and more and more isolated and self-isolating. If we follow into the 20s, he has a number of rather interesting and strange representations of the crucifixion. He has a number of rather interesting and strange images. There's one, a drawing that shows two men, and it's almost certainly Jesus and Judas, the one holding forth the other with an absolute look of evil in its eyes and with fingers and fingernails that look absolutely demonic. There are images that suggest a pieta with the virgin and the head of her son in her lap. There's a whole range of images that suggest a focus on Jesus and not always in a straightforward and simple manner. One image done in the 20s without a precise date gives us Golgotha and the three figures on crosses off to the upper left. Okay, fine, nothing unusual about that except describing a diagonal coming down from the upper right to the center of the painting is a procession that looks like a medieval procession in the middle of any number of medieval towns, a parish procession with pennants that have different images on them, although in his painting the images are unintelligible, but led by figures holding up, cardinals holding up an image of the crucified Christ and they can barely sustain its weight, it's starting to lean to one side. Again, not altogether unusual, the idea of the image of Christ in conjunction with the actual Christ is re recognized at the end of the 19th century in paintings, for example, like Paul Gauguin's Yellow Crucifixion, where Breton women in their piety, stopping to pray on the way home from work, are so taken up with their piety that this probably stone image of the crucified Christ starts to come alive for them. So the juxtaposition of a Christ that is raised up as a carved figure held in a procession and the actual image of Golgotha is not so strange, but if one follows that same diagonal from the procession down toward the lower left, it picks up another completely different procession that is slightly parallel, not exactly on the same line with it, a series of figures shaven heads, naked torsos, holding a palanquin on which there is a female whose arms are held up in a kind of Oran's position to the skies. Is it a female gesturing in an Oran's position towards Christ? But given how she looks, she's nude completely. And how the bearers of her palanquin look, they're naked from the waist up, they're shaven headed. It suggests something from Egypt or Mesopotamia, in other words, something pagan. And the audience of that part of the procession, over the so shoulders of whom we look, 
are also, all of them male, all of them shaven-headed, all of them apparently naked torsoed, and the whole thing suggests a kind of pagan procession which, as it were, emanates from the Christian procession. Is that just Fritz Asher being a strange fellow? Is it Fritz Asher thinking about the way in which Christianity is connected not only to Judaism but to paganism and thrusting that literally in that image, front and center? To the left of that procession, there's a figure gesturing kind of toward the procession and kind of toward Christ. On the opposite side, on the right hand, lower right of the image, is a figure that is clearly a bayazzo, a clown. We see by this pinkish, almost pajama-like uniform that he seems to be wearing, uh, a uniform that goes from neck to heel with a kind of flouncy collar around the neck. His gestures look like those of a clown and he's gesturing, well, it would seem to be in the direction of Christ. That is the Christ on Golgotha across diagonally to the upper left of the image. The juxtaposition of Christ and Bayazzo at first might simply be some sort of a mocking image, but on the other hand, when we think of the Bayazzo, the clown, that is another of those images that obsessed Fritz Asher again and again, and when we think back to the fact that I Pagliacci, the clowns, that opera by Leon Cavallo, had been composed about a decade before Fritz Asher's birth, and in the course of the years he spent in Berlin was being performed with Enrico Caruso singing the lead role, that's the figure of a clown who, while he makes others laugh, is weeping inside. He's weeping inside because he can't convince Colombina, his beloved, to love him. It's another for Einsamte kind of character, sui generis, apart, even from other clowns. He's a particular clown. And that image and that idea, which was in any case popular during the Weimar period in Berlin in the 20s, is particularly popular, it would seem, with Fritz Asher. So, by the way, are images like that of Beethoven. It turns out that Asher, aside from being a painter, had skill as a musician. He apparently composed music, and he was very much taken with music, in particular with Beethoven. Now, it's true that Beethoven is one of the two or three quintessential German composers. It's also true that he's the only one that at the height of his powers is going deaf, so would end up performing pieces as a conductor that he couldn't himself hear any longer except inside his head. That at the end of a piece, the lead violinist would turn him around toward the audience so that he could see what he couldn't hear, which was its applause, its cheers for him. If ever there were an individual who in the last decades of his life more and more becomes a Vereinsamte, it's Beethoven. And that's the composer among composers who most appeal to Fritz Asher, whose image we find again and again in his work. One Vereinsamte after another suggests a real sense of empathy and connection with that very idea. By 1933, of course, Hitler has come to power, and the world is becoming rapidly more and more difficult for Jews, whether or not they had been baptized out of Judaism, whether or not they consider themselves no longer to be Jews but to be Christians, Lutherans or Catholics. In Hitler's book, following the idea of Wilhelmar, they remain Jews. In 1938, November 9th, 10th, known as Kristallnacht, the Night of Broken Glass, for the first time, the Nazi party engages in and promotes active organized violence throughout Germany against Jewish communities. Perhaps seven or eight people died. Hundreds were injured. Synagogues were burned. Businesses were destroyed. Homes were crushed. And Fritz Asher is arrested and sent to Sachsenhausen concentration camp. Now one might ask whether he were arrested because he's a Jew or because he's considered his style of painting, that is, degenerate by the Nazis and therefore subversive. The fact that he's arrested on Kristallnacht suggests that they arrest him because they see him as a Jew, regardless of how he sees himself, and not because he's a degenerate. 
He's in Sachsenhausen for months. He's able to get out through the assistance of his lawyer, Grassmann, and an evangelical Christian minister by the name of Heinrich Gruber, who was notorious for trying to help Jews, who himself, by the way, would spend time in Auschwitz because he was too Jew-friendly. He stood up to Eichmann at one point, and he lost his teeth in Auschwitz. He survived, however. So Grassmann and Gruber get him out, get Fritz Ascher out of Sachsenhausen. But he's rearrested shortly thereafter and sent to Potsdam to a prison, and eventually he gets out of there too. He's got to check in with a kind of probation officer three times a week. And in 1941, it appears that things are getting rougher and things are getting uglier, and his probation officer says to him, look, you better get out of here. And what he does is seek out, and it's now 1942, the mother of his lawyer, Martha Grassmann, who had visited him to see his art in the past, and they had known each other somewhat. And she lived in the Grunewald, which was a very she-she part of Berlin, where by now, for the most part, Nazi officers had taken up residence in homes that had been confiscated, for the most part, from Jews like Hugo Ascher, Fritz's father, who had owned them before. And for the next three years, Ascher is hidden, for the most part, in the basement of one of the villas that had been bombed, living down there with the rats, the wild cats, and the sacks of potatoes. She hid three people. Two of them couldn't take it after a while. They went out walking and they were never seen again. Fritz Ascher remained in hiding. He had no access to art materials, so he wrote poetry, very dense and very interesting poetry about life, about love, about art, about artists who had influenced him, like Beethoven, like Münch, expressionist painters and terrific composers and the like. And he survived to the end of the war. In 1945, the war is over, and he, as it were, comes out of hiding. He's very much a Vereinsamte, a man who has completely changed from the social creature he had been prior to World War I, who had become more and more isolated and self-isolating, lonely and alone in the intervening couple of decades. And certainly after 1945, while he starts painting again, his painting has changed in one respect, and his loneliness is more accentuated. There were individuals who lived in the villa that had been broken into apartments, the same villa as did Fritz Ascher with Martha Grassmann, with whom he continued to live until the end of his life. And we have accounts from kids who were kids at that point of what it was like to live near this artist. And he seemed to be more comfortable with kids than with adults. His painting that reemerged continued to be expressionistic as it had been before, but now very, very little evidence of humanity, landscapes, nature, sunsets, trees, sunflowers, nature in its continuity, nature in its purity, nature expressed on the canvas almost like relief carving with a thickness of its impasto. Although interestingly, on the side as he still drew and occasionally worked with watercolor and the like, there we find human figures occasionally. But his oil paintings to his last one, painted a year and a half or so before his death in 1970, are all about these kinds of brutally beautiful landscapes. The last year or two of his life seemed to have been marked both by Parkinson's disease and with it an increasing sense of depression. And when what proves to be three months before his death, the building in which he and Martha Grossman had been living is sold and they have to find some apartment in which to stay, it clearly is the last touch for his last isolation. He dies, as I say, in 1970, just three months after that point. Martha Grossman would die about a year later, and they're buried together in the same grave.